Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Let's Play Every Day. I'm Tim McNiff, and every day it is my honor to welcome an esteemed group of panelists, influencers in the Minnesota sports, business, and entertainment community to take on Minnesota's sports talkers of the day. This program sponsored by Northern Lids for the finest in custom patch caps and knit hats. Check them out at northernlids.com. We greatly appreciate their support. All right, let's meet our distinguished list of panelists. Andy Greeter, sports writer at the St. Paul Pioneer Press, Andy's Current Beats, the Golden Gophers, and Minnesota United. Heather Rule just wrapped up a season working for the Minnesota Twins, is now moving on to other projects, including prep sports, coverage for local outlets, and Heather and I may have made a little side connection here on something else, and it could be potentially bubbling up in her future. That's kind of cool. And local comedian Greg Coleman Jr., or G2, back after taking some well-deserved time off to welcome a new addition to his family. Greg, can you tell us about that new addition? It's a baby. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks. Thanks for clearing that up. <laughs> yeah. No, uh, it's great. I am a father now. I wasn't last time I was here to a beautiful and healthy baby girl named Zana Rose. And it's been all of the things that, like, they say, like, oh, you're not going to get sleep. And like, you know, when you hear people, they tell like dad jokes and like those corny anecdotes. And I'm like, I'm never going to be that person. And then come to find out I'm that person. Like she's peed on me. She's pooped on me right after we've changed the diapers. I'm like, man, this baby's hack. Like do something original. But, you know, it's uh, it's been good. Um, congratulations. And, and I know you've heard this from everybody else, but please. Because I never do anything that's original anyway. Can I just add my voice to the chorus? It is going to go way faster than you think it is. So even when you're in those times when there's the pee and there's the poop and all the rest of it, just be there in the moment. Because I'm telling you, you're going to look back and you're going to go, how did that happen so fast? Yeah. Well, I have no choice but to be in the moment. Tim, I haven't figured out space travel yet and time travel. <laughs> But, you know, I'm doing my best. Like, that's why I'm like, just remember this because she's changed so much. So I'm like, OK, all that stuff they say is true. So keep I'm taking sure the videos. The moments. Yeah, keep taking yeah, the videos. Sure. Well, thank you for your time and great to have you back with us on to the sports of the morning, folks. The Gopher football team has been dealing with, quite frankly, a scary situation. They left running back Trey Potts in a West Lafayette hospital after Saturday's game with an unspecified ailment. Potts left that game against Purdue in the fourth quarter and he was evaluated by medical staff before being placed in a local hospital. Andy, you were with the team on that trip. Uh, is there anything available as an update on Trey's condition? Yeah, I mean, it's it's a very bizarre situation because, you know, he had a carry uh, in the late fourth quarter as they were trying to drive and kind of salt away the game. And, you know, he rushed for six yards and kind of pop up, popped up afterwards after getting tackled and didn't seem any worse for the wear. It seemed like he was fine. And they they switched formations and went to their kind of wildcat look and, and Trey's day uh, was done. Uh, I didn't see him need attention on the sideline. I didn't see him go to the locker room. Uh, it wasn't brought up post game. Um, I first heard about it on Monday and went back and watched the play. And, and uh, you know, like I said, didn't see anything that, that stood out as to what was going on. I've heard a few things about what's what's happening but i haven't been able to confirm it so i don't really feel like i, can, I can't report it so i can't share it here yep um but yeah i mean it's it's certainly concerning right i mean anytime you go to the hospital uh it's serious obviously and every time you stay there for multiple days like he has uh it's even more concerning um you know I, i've done some due diligence and i've reached out to you know his parents and to see what's going on i did a story on him a couple of weeks ago and they kind of remained on the sidelines and kind of stayed out of the public eye and didn't really want to be a part of that story. So I think they're kind of a private family. So obviously people want to know what's going on with Trey and his health and, and his importance to the football team, um, but also trying to respect some privacy. So yeah, hopefully, you know, today or tomorrow, there is an update that I can share. Well, we appreciate that. I'm not going to push you any further on that because we do need to respect the privacy of the family and, and the university has said when, when they're ready, to make a statement, they will. So thank you, Andy. We, we, we do appreciate that. All right, we're going to stay with uh, college football and get outside Minnesota for a moment. Um, the Red River Shootout, which is the annual football game played between the University of Oklahoma and the University of Texas as part of the Texas State Fair, uh, underwent a name change to the Red River, Red River Rivalry to remove any reference to gunplay. Greg, 
What's the better idea, adding a major annual rivalry football game connected to the Minnesota State Fair or just extending the Minnesota State Fair from 12 days to a month like they do down in Texas? Uh, I, I, I'm not a big fan of doing exactly what Texas does uh, right now, <laughs> you know, just across the board. Um, you know, but <laughs> I just find it really crazy that texas is like hey let's take the word gun out of the rev rival rival so like it's texas all you guys do is talk about guns man <laughs> they're gonna say it's gonna be a shootout or are they gonna say it's gonna be a lot of points scored in this one like listen man you've branded yourself texas stay with it as far as something like that coming for the minnesota i am all for extending the minnesota state fair i am I I mean, not the people, just the food. If we throw a game in there and call it Minnesota State Fair, football, folly, a heart attack bowl, I'm with it as long as I can get some cheese curds at halftime. <laughs> I'm with you. I mean, you know, we take the – instead of getting 2 million people in 12 days, spread it out a month. Everybody doesn't have to go at the same time. They worry about we won't have enough help. Not everyone's going to go when school starts, right? You won't need as many people on Monday through Thursday. I said we make this thing a month like Texas and just do that. All right. Yeah. The, the other big game on Saturday has number three in unbeaten Iowa hosting number four in unbeaten Penn State. Now, the Nittany Lions have already gone into Madison and mowed down Bucky Badger. But Iowa went to Iowa State and subdued the Cyclones. It's a pretty good football team. Heather, who wins on Saturday in Iowa City and why? Iowa. Um, they're at home, first of all. And I could see it being a really low-scoring game, a, a tough defensive battle. It's two really good defenses going up against each other. Uh, but Iowa's numbers stick out a little bit more to me with um, the inter interceptions that the defense has had. I I think they have already like 20 points on on their defense this season and plus the the games too between Penn State and Iowa have been really low scoring um in in recent history and I think what did I see Penn State's won the last six meetings between these two so there's that too Iowa's going to want to break the the losing streak especially being at home um so but just seeing how how close it's been between the two um and the it, the defense, I think Iowa is what, like second in the nation and Penn State is third in the nation in, in points allowed. Um, so it, it'll be tough for the offenses to score, but I think that I give the defensive edge to Iowa. And the home game, I tell you what, for a non SEC game, I'm looking forward to this one. All right, the Gopher football team is on the bye week this week. They return to action a week from Saturday when they host Nebraska. Obviously, football aside, we all just want what's best for Trey Potts at this point. But Andy, could this bye week? possibly be coming at a better time for the school for football team. I mean, I don't know, Tim. I mean, in all, in all the sports cliches that you hear, you know, the bye week coming at the right time is maybe the one that annoys me the most. Oh, love cause it. like, cause like with Greg, like Greg said, like we haven't invented time travel yet. So we don't know what's going to happen in a couple of weeks and they could be, you know, decimated by injuries and they could come at a better time in a couple of weeks. I think ideally you'd want it to be, you know, the middle of the season, right. The middle of the big 10 season. You know, they've played two Big Ten games and have seven yet to go. So you want to maybe rest kind of in the middle, uh, kind of at halftime. So I don't know. I, I I think that, yeah, with Trey Potts and with, you know, Chris Ahmed Bell and Mario, I'm sorry, Marin uh, dinged up, um, I think it's helpful for them for sure. But you've kind of changed the, the story a little bit from coming out of Bowling Green with the win against Purdue. So maybe you do want to keep things going. So. Yeah, I think it's half of one, six dozen of the other. Love it. All right. The temptation is to look at the one and three Viking schedule and do a loud exhale when you see the 0 4 Detroit Lions come to town this Sunday. But like the Browns, the Lions also feel pretty good about their offensive line. Greg, despite the addition of quarterback Jared Goff, should we expect the Lions to try to copy the Browns by chewing up both the yards and the clock on the ground on Sunday? Uh, I have no expectations for the Lions. I feel like the Lions, you know, they're a desperate team. And I kind of feel like the Vikings always kind of put themselves in this position whenever they start out slow. Like we'll look at the Lions and we're like, oh, okay, we can get one. They haven't won a game. And then we get like clobber knocked or have an ugly, ugly win because they're just, they're desperate. They're going to do whatever. It's going to turn into a WWE match. I mean, honestly, I feel like, the Vikings don't necessarily need to be concerned. I mean, you got to do your due diligence 
but being concerned if they're going to try to take up the clock and chew it up like happened with the Browns, I really feel like this is a game where the Vikings need to insert themselves and um, like just, hey, we control the tempo. We make the decisions. We are the better team. You guys make adjustments to us. If we're going to run, we are going to run. If we're going to throw and get a balance, like I really feel like this is one of the ones where the Vikings need to really flex their horns and just be the dominant team and just make Detroit like, hey, you're an opponent. Whatever you want to do doesn't matter. You know, we spent this money. We got these guys. We got this talent. You guys adjust us. I love it. Uh, hang on to that thought for just a moment. If you're looking for good news where the Vikings are concerned, head coach Mike Zimmer says linebacker Anthony Barr should make his 2021 debut on Sunday. Barr's been dealing with a bulky knee since August, and I had to look this up more than once. He's only 29. I kept thinking Anthony Barr has to be in his 30s, right? He's been here forever, but no, 29. So Barr has only played in two games since the 2019 season. Heather, what are what should be the reasonable expectations regarding return of Anthony Barr on Sunday? I think it'll be a big sigh of relief once it's game time and he's starting. He's out on the field. Um, you know, I think Zimmer said I think he'll play on Sunday, so let's hope hope that he does play. Uh, but for being out so long, I, you know, I think expectations can't be that he'll come in and just be the game changer immediately. Um, there's always the concern too, that, you know, what if he gets out there and there's, you know, a couple plays and re-injured, you know, a, a, again, but his presence will be huge, I think, for the Vikings because they'll want him out on the field. And I, I'd expect maybe at least a sack from him on Sunday, but, you know, if he's not out there making plays right away, right out of the gate and being like the usual Anthony Barr that everyone knows, I don't think that's super concerning right away. Maybe let him get a game under his belt and then see what he does next week. All right. Uh, you know, a good host would have gone out of order and just gone from Greg to Andy. But if I don't have a teleprompter and I don't, I have a script and I'm staying to my script because I'm an empty shell. I'm an empty vessel, folks. So we're going to come back to what Greg Coleman was saying just a moment ago, Andy. After Detroit, the Vikings schedule includes teams with a combined record of 16 and 7. And the next time they're going to see a team with a losing record could be in a rematch with Detroit on December 5th. So, Andy, like Greg was saying, the style points matter. And by that, I mean, is how you beat the Lions almost as important as just getting the win if the Vikings want to improve their record and their team psyche? Uh, no, I think, you know, if they win 2-0 to zero in this game, <laughs> that'll be good enough i think just because you started one and three right and you have that schedule coming up and you have to take care of business and if it's ugly mike zimmer won't be complaining about a shutout i think people will be talking about kirk cousins after that game if it's <laughs> two to zip but yeah i think you you need to get a win right i mean they've they're you know a, a bizarre team in the fact that they've outscored their opponents this year and and have a losing record and they have I think one or two turnovers. And I think that's been very rarely done in the NFL of outscoring an opponent, having fewer than two turnovers and sitting at one and three. So they've been hard lucked. Uh, it's been a, a, a difficult year for them uh, in certain respects. So anything, anything goes as long as it's a W I think for the Vikings. All right. It was announced yesterday afternoon that Allianz field in St. Paul will be the host site for next year's major league soccer all-star game. Now this will be the eighth pro sports all-star game held in Minnesota but this one will be different from most of the previous ones for several reasons. Andy, you are the uh, MLS guy and the uh, United guy. How does the MLS soccer uh, all-star game differ from most professional sports? Yeah, so for the last 15 years, it's been uh, the MLS versus another team from another league, uh, primarily a top flight European club, the Bayern Munichs, the Chelsea's, the you know Real Madrid's of the world. Uh, so that's who they have come in on a kind of a preseason tour, and it's an exhibition game with those those teams. Uh, last year, they switched it up, and they brought uh, All-Stars from Liga MX, uh, which is the Mexican League. And it was, you know, All-Stars versus All-Stars from different leagues uh, with different bragging rights between countries who don't always like each other. Uh, so the game got a little edgy, a little chippy. It was not, you know, like an NBA All-Star game when it was 175 to 176, and it was just – Checking up three pointers, nobody played any defense. Uh, this one had a little bit of a real life soccer feel to it, um, and the league is expanding uh, with a 
interseason tournament with Liga Mekis going into uh, the upcoming years. Uh, so I thought that for sure they'd want to keep up this all-star format because they had success with it. And quite frankly, uh, Liga Mekis outdraws MLS in the U.S. as far as TV ratings go. So if you put the Mexican League against the U.S. and Can- uh, Canadian League, uh, the ratings are going to go up and you're going to have more interest in the game. So I thought for sure when I asked Commissioner Don Garber who was going to be the opponent next year, he was going to maybe couch his answer but lead towards you know, maybe bringing back the Mexican League. Uh, but he didn't, and he talked about kind of a new narrative. So I, I wonder if they're going to go back to the European format and bring in a team uh, from over there. We'll have to wait and see. But uh, that's maybe the, the biggest difference between the two, uh, the All-Star game and MLS and the other ones. As a, as a person who's not really, you know, I'm not an ardent fan. I follow, but just sort of distant. I, I thought that was very interesting. I wasn't familiar that they did that with their all-star game. And I think that's yeah. intriguing. And the thought of having others throw out Bayern Munich or Manchester United, that to me would be very interesting. I would find that I'd be like, oh, I'm interested in that. Yeah, for sure. And a lot of people are if they have, you know, connections on those teams. You know, if there's U.S. players on those teams, if you – um, want to see yourself against them. But yeah, I mean, those those teams are coming in on preseason, right? So they're not going very hard. They're not playing very much. They usually have the kids play uh, in the later half of those games. So it doesn't really have a whole lot of gotcha. appeal. And I think some people are like uh, internally saying, hey, let's go back to the format that we had uh, previous of 15 years ago, where it was just a, an MLS versus MLS. Like, are we bringing ourselves to a lower level if we have a, a team from Europe come in that is on a preseason tour and we're kind of short trifting the players that we do have in this league. It's uh, a good point. All right. Well, MLS commissioner Don Garber said the game was just not awarded to the loons, but that they'd earned it. Well, maybe, maybe not. Uh, consider that Minneapolis got the NBA all-star game after building target center. Um, St. Paul got the NHL all-star game after building XL energy center uh, and the Major League Baseball game came to Minneapolis first after they built the Metrodome, then again after the construction of Target Field. Heather, when the commissioner says they earned it, is he referring to the organization and how they've handled business on the pitch or just talking about how much they spent to be? <laughs> and he's already given the answer, how much they spent to get the team and build the stadium. Yeah, it's it's all about the money and L.A. Um <laughs> It's it's all about that for, for any All-Star game. If there's you know, if I hear the city or where, you know, the all-star game is going to be for any sport. And I, even if I'm not familiar with, with their venue or stadium or arena, I think, okay, well, they must've got a new one within the last couple of years. Um, all the examples that you mentioned for Minnesota, I think three, four, five years within opening, they had the all-star game. So it's, you know, it, it's why the all-star game at the Metrodome was in 1985 and they didn't have one in, 1997 you know it's it, it's all about the newness and they they want to showcase the product of the sport in the best way possible for an event like that which is going to have national or international in this case eyes and you want to put out the best product for people that might not be tuning in otherwise that if this is their only shot they want to show you hey look at this or for people that come to the event too that you know, haven't been to the state before, haven't been to the city before, they want to put on the best show possible. So yeah, it's, it's all about the money when it comes to these all-star games and, and stuff like that. So yeah, it's, and he's right. Well, it couldn't come at a better time of year. That's for sure. Okay. Now the last time Andy was here, uh, we talked about how many of the Loons fans really don't like their head coach, Adrian Heath, and they're not shy about it. Uh, Greg, I'm wondering, regardless of sport, why is it that the fans always seem to know so much more about how to run the team than the man or woman who actually get paid to run the team? Well, it's because we have the Internet, you know, (laughs) well, most of the time. (laughs) We didn't have the Internet yesterday and all those people had no idea what was going on. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I think it's just really fun. The Monday morning quarterback, you know, like you're not involved. And also, like, our opinions, I, I, it's really just social media and it's something to talk about. You know, like, it's been something that happened in the 60s uh, that people would talk about, oh, well, we should have did this, we should have did that at the water cooler or at the local bar. And then, you know, we did it at the 80s when people were spray painting their hair or getting their Zubas together. <laughs> like, it's just something to talk about. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, and I've I've done it too. Like, you know, one more loss, and I'm like, yo, Zim's got to get out of here, yo. <laughs> like, that's what's going on in the group chat. So it's no different. It's just we got a worldwide group chat, and it's just something fun to talk about. And yes, we all know better than the president of the team. It's just the American way. We have the freedom to talk crap, so we're going to do it. it. Makes me think of the late, late Dennis Green who always said, it's a great thing about America. Everybody's got an opinion. The other great thing about America, you don't have to listen to them. So That's there you true. go. Hey, uh, Andy, uh, Loon's manager Adrian Heath would be set to coach that MLS All-Star game, but I'm wondering if his Loon's team fails to make the playoffs, is there any chance that Heath won't be around to coach that uh, game next year? Uh, that's, that's a very good question, right? I mean, this is a team that went to the Western conference final last year was one game away from playing for MLS cup and had expectations to go further this year and, and haven't met those, you know, they, they want to have a home field game at Allianz field, uh, come November. And right now they're sitting in seventh and last place and would have to go on the road for any sort of playoff run that they could manufacture. So yeah, it's been disappointing in that regard. You know, they're eight points out of the four spot for a home playoff game with seven to go. Uh, so it looks pretty daunting. Um, but I asked Bill McGuire this yesterday. I said, is there a chance that you can finish in the four spot? And he goes, yeah, we can win seven games in a row. I go, oh, okay, <laughs> win seven games in a row. Yeah, sounds pretty easy. It's way beyond the pace that you've set this year or any time that you've had <laughs> your uh, MLS franchise. Uh, but that's kind of the expectation that he has for the team. Um, he's also really close uh, with Adrian Heath um, and he feels like it's going in the right direction. When I asked uh, Bill McGuire for their own four start, kind of where he felt the future was for Adrian Heath. Um, and he said, you know, it takes time to build something. Um, he wasn't willing to, to just say that, you know, Hey, enough is enough. Uh, and he was willing to say that four plus years into it. So um, I don't think he's on the hot seat. Um, I do think that there is an expectation internally to to get to the playoffs, to maybe get a home game, to go on a little bit of a run. Uh, but I don't think it it gets blown up if if things don't go their way. Sounds like Bill's not spending a lot of time on Loon's Twitter. Uh, no, he, he is he is not. I don't. I have, I've yet to find his burner account. I've been looking. <laughs> <laughs> All right, just a few quick ones on the way out, you guys. Heather, I'm going to put you on the spot. Uh, last night we saw the Red Sox beat the Yankees in, in one play-in game. And then, of course, we've got the uh, Dodgers playing at, uh, despite 106 wins, playing at St. Louis today. Heather, who wins the World Series and why? San, Fr San Francisco Giants. Uh, even though they won the NL West, they had 107 wins. I feel like I'm still seeing a lot of people just kind of brushing them off. I've seen a lot of picks for the Dodgers, which I think is interesting because – I guess I don't know why they're playing the game tonight then, if the Dodgers are apparently just going to move on. Um, I also saw a lot of picks for the Yankees to be in the World Series, which clearly that's not happening either, um, which is what happens when you have a one-game wild card, which we could talk about that format another time too. But, you know, the Dodgers have to win a game first. That's how the format is set up. So um, I think, you know, the Giants do have plenty of experience as an organization. Earlier, you know, a decade ago, they won three World Series. And... Buster Posey is still around. He's looking for World Series number four with the Giants. Um, you know, they led the NL in home runs this year. Pitching staff, I think, is second um, in the league with their ERA. So they have plenty of veterans and some young guys in their lineup, too. I think, you know, they, they've got the pieces to put together a good run. I think that if the Dodgers do win tonight, it um, would be an interesting series between the two of them. But you know, they're in the same division, too. I don't think they are going to be scared of the Dodgers and just have them get steamrolled. Um, so, and there's also, you know, locally people have been following uh, Lamont Wade Jr. was a pickup for the Giants, too. So <laughs> um, his clutch bat in the late innings has been big for them. Um, and then also uh, Taylor Rogers' brother um, for, for the Twins. Tyler Rogers is out of the pen, too. So I think they have the pieces to put it together. And I'm you know, I'm not going to just hand the trophy to the Dodgers again. So, no, no, I wouldn't. You know, for I'm just going to put this out there. Love the Rays because you've got the 26th highest of payroll in baseball. I'm pulling for you. Uh, but I, nobody's talking about the White Sox. And one thing I like about the White Sox is every time they get in a big series, they show up. 
I mean, they just show up and they show out. And so I'm really intrigued to see what the White Sox are all about, you know, when the, and the bright lights are on. All right. So, um, Greg, um, is there any way that the Gopher men's basketball team does not finish in last place in the Big Ten this season? Yes. There is a way. They just need to win one more game than the next person. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's going to be a tough one. It's, yeah, I mean, maybe if they had a time machine, they could go back and get Chet. Maybe it would be a little bit different, you know? But, yeah, I don't know. It's probably not going to look good for the Gophers. I don't want to talk too much crap because these kids are like 19 and 20, you know, but just as an organization, uh, Minnesota basketball, you You've been a little bit disappointing, and it's – I don't feel like the expectations are super high, which also, you know, leaves them some space to surprise us. Hopefully it will be a surprise. Hopefully it will be a young team that just kind of, you know, comes together and maybe gets it done, you know, like like the Tropics and uh, – what was that, Dewey? <laughs> that movie, you know what I'm talking about, the ABA. Got to play their way to stay. <laughs> Hopefully that will happen with the men's Gophers team this year. Or otherwise, you know, I don't know. Maybe we see a lot of technical fouls and they just become the toughest team in the league. I'd settle for that. Yeah, you know, not since Clem Haskins rolled out the Iron Five, where he literally had five guys on, on the team. Have I ever gone into a season saying, wow, it's it's going to be rough. Um, Andy, this is your beat. Uh, so, but I'll take you down a specific path. Um, what are your expectations regarding Lindsay Whalen's gopher team? She's got a few more years on the job than Ben Johnson does. Yeah, yeah, this is her this is her fourth year. Um, and I asked Mark Coyle that in an interview in August, just given that it's her fourth year. And, you know, she had nine wins in the Big Ten her first year and then five her second year and, and seven last year. So she's been either 500 or under 500 for her first three years. Um, and he said, you know, he likes what they've been building there. Um, but I think she needs to have a big ten, a winning record in the Big Ten, right? I mean, she's got a deep team. She's got some freshman standouts. She's got an incredible recruiting class coming in. I think they've got three of the top 100 in the in the country, um, and I think that's you know impressive haul for them. But yeah, I think it needs to show up on the court. Last year, I think of of any team had a uh, COVID mulligan where they had I think like three healthy players going into the first game, just ridiculous. Um, so yeah, I think, you know, it's, it's a winning record in the big 10. It's, it's maybe getting to the tournament. It's starting to show that all the things that you're building on the recruiting trail come to fruition at Williams arena. And that's, where we're going to leave it for today. I very much appreciate your guys' time. Thank you so much. Um, Greg, I think the last time you were here, you had just dropped a, an, an album, yeah. right? And yeah, what, yeah. what is, the, what is the album and how's that going? Um, it, it went, it did really well for, uh, the first weekend I was number one until Bo Burnham's fans woke up and then they just bought his album again. Um, but no, it's doing well. It's available on all streaming platforms or Bandcamp or also on YouTube. Um, yeah, so no, it's, it's been good and I'm gearing up for my next album. That's going to drop November 5th. And the album that we're talking about currently is called... Oh, Dad's Garage. Yes, for sure. The first album is called Dad's Garage. Dad's Garage and another one in the works. Love it. Um, yeah. Andy, anything you're working on that we should keep an eye out for? Yeah, I'm working on a on a story about how the Gopher football team uses uh, pro football focus data uh, to kind of look at how they do things uh, in-house and how they, how they scout, how they grade players, and then kind of what sort of takeaways have come from the first five weeks of Gopher football based on that data. And uh, final word, Heather, uh, where can people follow you and your work? I am at HL Rule on uh, Twitter and Instagram. And also I've been working on updating my online portfolio, um, basically uh, heatherrule.com. Excellent. Thank you. And you guys, I appreciate uh, your contributions sincerely. You know, on this program, I try to wrap things up by putting like my own take or my own spin on something after I put these guys out there. I just say, well, you know, maybe I'll go out there and say something from time to time as well. And, you know, I was putting together questions for this program here today, and I started to toe the line about vaccines and mandates. And as I did so, I kind of was going down this tunnel, and it became increasingly difficult for me to formulate the questions. And it was at that point I realized 
it's probably time to press the delete key and, and just hold it there. And I did that. Look, you didn't come to this program here for politics and neither did any of my guests. So I'll try to keep that in mind going forward, but no promises. You see, sometimes the vaccine can be less painful than talking about the Vikings. And we're only a quarter away through the season. So we'll just take it from there. Big thanks again to our panelists for the day. I, of course, want to give a big shout out to Nick Gross and the good folks at Northern Lids for their continued support. We call this program Let's Play Every Day, and it is a part of LPSN or the Let's Play Sports Network. Please check out our other fine properties via our Facebook page or our YouTube channel. Thank you for watching or listening. I want you to have a great week, and we hope to see you right back here tomorrow morning on Let's Play Every Day.